That seems too loud to me. How about you, Adam? I can hear it. Ah, okay, that's fine. Well, I can tell you one thing, keeping up with the, Is everybody going to the ballet tomorrow night? If you're going to host a ballet dancer, you have to burn the candle at both ends. And I'm sort of flying on autopilot right now. Uh, so uh, I have to confess to you to start out with that uh, I really feel insecure being here. I don't feel like I have the knowledge or the authority to be standing in front of you expounding on the Word of God. So, if you see lightning start striking up here in a few minutes, just keep calm, wait till the smoke clears and figure that I probably was not expressing the opinions of management, okay? <laughs> Love the sinner, hate the sin. Uh, so why is that a half-truth? I can tell you in about a minute and we can all go home or I can give you the long story that the short answer is uh, love the sinner, hate the sin, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> is a half truth because we can't do it. We can't separate the sinner from the sin. Have you ever tried? Has anybody ever wronged you? Has anybody ever stolen something of yours? Have you ever been cut off in traffic? Do you love Adolf Hitler? Do you have any love for Bernie Madoff? What about the man who recently opened and rather quickly closed the Pink Ribbon Restaurant? Do you have some love for him? So that's the short answer is we just can't do it. Take it on as a project. It'd be a good Sunday school project to um, see whether you can separate the sinner from the sin and come back and talk about it. Uh, so is it in the Bible? In fact, no, it's not in the Bible. What does the Bible say about uh, love the sinner, hate the sin? What is it in love the sinner? What does the Bible say about love? Who does the Bible say that we should love? Neighbor? Neighbor? God? Self? Lord, God, yeah. So, love God, love your neighbor, love yourself. Anybody else? Sermon on the Mount? Enemies? Why should you love your enemies? <laughs> Loving your enemies... <laughs> That is what is going to transform God's creation. And that's what we're here about, right? Loving your enemies. Does the Bible say anything about loving sinners? Well, not directly, no. And why does it not say anything about loving sinners? It may have something to do with judgment and something to do with pride. In order to label someone as a sinner or label an act as a sin, then you've got to pass judgment on someone. And when you pass judgment on someone, that most serious of the seven deadly sins is likely to raise its ugly head because of the pride that you might exhibit in labeling someone else as a sinner. So judgment uh, and pride enter into it as well. Uh, What does the Bible say about judgment? Who gets to be the judge in the Bible? Who get to be judges? Who's in charge of judging and punishment? Yeah, judgment is all over the Bible, but it really doesn't talk about neighbor judging neighbor. What does it say about neighbor judging neighbor? Um, yeah, yeah, but you're getting ahead of me. Uh, it says, judge not that ye be not judged. Where does it go after that? 
Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you make, you will be judged. And the measure you give will be the measure that you get. So that seems to be saying, be cautious about judging your neighbor. What are we supposed to do with our, la- with our neighbors? We're not supposed to judge them. We're supposed to love them, right? And God is to be the judge. How about the Pope? The Pope. The Pope should be a pretty good judge, right? He's infallible. What did the Pope say last year when he was asked to speak on homosexuality? Let me quote. People should not be defined by their sexual tendencies. God loves all of his creatures. Who am I to judge? Mercy is the first attribute of God. If someone is gay and searches for the Lord and has goodwill, who am I to judge? So even the Pope seems to come out against judging your neighbor. So judging is not in your, God, in your job description. Love is in your job description. Okay, hate the sin. Uh, I thought I'd spend the rest of the time talking about sin. Should be good for all of us. Uh, Lent is traditionally a time to be spent in introspection and doing penance. What is penance? Most literally, penance means punishment, doing penance. Anybody here raised in the Catholic tradition? Any? <laughs> Have you ever done any penance? <laughs> Can it, either of you want to say anything about doing penance? What it? When I was a child, I can remember going to confession, and usually I felt like I was having to figure out what my, my sins were for me. You know, it was fighting with my sisters and not knowing what my mother wanted, something like that. And usually it was like, you know, do seven young men. Okay, so sentence is, penance is punishment, basically, but in a Christian tradition, would you all agree that sentence might, penance might be uh, repair, repairing for your sins? Okay, good. So I would like to take us on a brief history of sin, if that's okay with you all. I'd like to talk about sin... <clears throat> The first sin, I'd like to talk about sin at the time of the deluge, sin when the children of Israel were wandering through the desert, sin at the time of Jeremiah, and sin at the time of Christ. Uh, First of all, how about a definition of sin? Missing the mark. You were listening when Rita was talking. Anybody else? I was going to say, where's Hannah Whitehurst when you need her, but we've got, I need. There it is. Everybody hear that? Any want of conformity to or transgression of the law of God. Okay? Or as Rita told us a few weeks ago, Sin is missing the mark. If the archers missed the mark, that was, the word was chada, I think she said, and somehow in Greek that means missing the mark. So sin is missing the mark, getting in wrong relationship with God, getting out of sync with God, okay? So, The first sin, what happened in the Garden of Eden? It's not actually defined as a sin, but it's pretty commonly, generally recognized as a sin. God tells Adam and Eve, 
do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So what do they do? Of course, they eat from the, knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They get the knowledge of good and evil. Um, not only that, uh, according to the Westminster Catechism, it fell to their posterity as well. And so we are posterity of Adam and Eve. And in fact, if you look just above your eye and you find your ventral lateral nucleus of the prefrontal cortex, that's probably where the knowledge of good and evil resides. And if you look at um, non-primates, you're not likely to find that. And if you look in non-human primates, they don't seem to have much of one. So that's probably, for what it's worth, where the knowledge of good and evil is. <laughs> Just to show that you're related to Adam and Eve, I guess. Um, <clears throat> So uh, Adam and Eve, they disobey God, they sin, they are guilty, and they're punished, right? Now, several generations, Genesis chapter 6, I think it is. Uh, let me read this to you. This is so good. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only continually evil. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth. What did the Lord do next? Blood. Wipes everybody out. But Noah found favor in the eyes of God. That didn't help the people who all got drowned and washed away, right? So here we are again. Knowledge of good and evil, wickedness, evil, guilt, sin, punishment. Okay? Let's move forward a bit to the time when the children of Israel are wandering through the wilderness led by Moses. This time God says, okay, I'm going to give them a rule book. And not only am I going to give them a rule book, I'm going to tell them what the consequences are. So he calls Moses up on the mountain and starts giving Moses the Ten Commandments and the rest of the Jewish law. While Moses is up there, what are the, 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 is the children of Israel doing? Yeah, they're down there busily making a golden calf. And <clears throat> God looks down and sees it and decides that his wrath is going to burn hot. Moses says, wait, wait just a minute. He goes down and he takes the golden calf uh, and grinds it up into a powder and throws it in the water and makes everybody drink it. Uh, and then he asks who's on the side of God, which is the sons of Levi. The sons of Levi draw their swords and kill 3,000 of their friends and neighbors and family. Disobedience, guilt, sin, punishment, right? Okay, uh, <clears throat> so they have the, um, the rule book, the Jewish law, the Ten Commandments, and as I think Brooks Peters alluded to a couple of weeks ago, a man was found gathering sticks on the Sabbath, which is punishable by what? Being put to death. So what happens, to, so the man who was gathering sticks on the Sabbath is brought before Moses and Aaron and the rest of the congregation and they turn to God and God says, put him to death. So he's killed. Fast forward now to about 600 BC to the time of Jeremiah and Ezekiel and what's going on then? In chapter one of uh, Jeremiah, Jeremiah says, and they are making offerings to other gods. They're worshiping the works of their own hands. Does that sound familiar? They're worshiping Baal and Moloch and Ferrari and 401k <laughs> and the highway. And Jeremiah says, you're heading for a fall. What happens? Nebuchadnezzar comes, 
conquer the Israelites, take them into exile for 70 years. But Jeremiah says in chapter 31, I think it is, of the book, he says, I hope I don't have to quote this one. Um, he, Jeremiah hints at a new covenant, potentially. The Lord says, I will make a new covenant. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. They will all know me for I will forgive their iniquities and remember their sins no more. That sounds different, doesn't it? That scripture from Jeremiah is also quoted verbatim in the 10th chapter of Hebrews. Everybody say that. Hebrews chapter, yeah. that's your assignment. Go home and read chapter 10 from Hebrews. Um, so let's go forward now to the time of Jesus. Remember the story of the woman who is brought to Jesus having been caught in the act of adultery. They bring the woman to her and they say, the law of Moses says that she should be stoned to death. What does Jesus do? Right. First thing he does is says, who doesn't have any sin? You throw the first stone. So they, and by saying that, he is saying, don't judge your neighbor. Right? I mean, that I think is the way I interpret it. Uh, he, and the, the people who brought the woman before God said maybe he, before Jesus said, well, maybe he's right, and, and they slink off. And then what does he say to the woman who was caught in adultery? Go forth and sin no more. So that old paradigm of disobedience, sin, guilt, uh, punishment seems to be being supplanted by a new covenant of disobedience, guilt, sin, forgiveness. And ultimately, God goes on to sacrifice himself for the sins of the world, as we all know, rather than to punish the world. Uh, once again, <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 10 has got a good description of God's new covenant of grace with humankind. Now, our Sunday school class recently discussed a book by Barbara Brown Taylor entitled Speaking of Sin. The second... Adam, you're not running the PowerPoint. I guess I'll have to do it. Boy, am I behind. <laughs> okay, where was I? Uh, oh, yeah, Barbara Brown Taylor's book. Her, the, the argument that she has in the book is that we are beginning to lose the language of this new covenant of sin, repentance, forgiveness, salvation. And she is saying that we are in fact human beings, we have human tendencies, we have human appetites, we have human behaviors, we're stuck with being human. We're jealous, we're tribal, we're territorial, we're envious, 
We can't control our behaviors. We can't control our appetites. As I tell my teenagers at the health department, listen, Mother Nature wants you to be pregnant now. You are paddling upstream. Sometimes it takes. So, we want for control of our behaviors. Um, we subject ourselves to undeserved feelings of guilt. We forget that God loves us. We find ourselves missing the mark. We get in wrong relationship with God. We get out of sync with God. And then we fail to do anything about it. It feels bad, but we stay in that same state of not doing anything about this wrong relationship that we've gotten ourselves into. So, the assurance of forgiveness that follows sincere repentance of sin can give you the courage to take responsibility for your sins. And that is the first step in changing your behaviors. Want me to say it again? I don't know whether I could or not, but the assurance of forgiveness and grace that follows sincere repentance of sin can give you the courage to enable you to take steps to changing your behavior to get you back in right relationship with God. Okay? But for some reason, we often don't do that. That's where repentance may be useful. So, repentance and penance can be more than just confessing our sins. It can be getting us to adopting new behaviors, to getting on the road, to changing our behaviors. So that repentance can be part of our personal and God's overall CQI, God's Continuing Quality Improvement Program. And if God's purpose is the transformation of his wicked creation, then perhaps sin, the recognition of it, and trying to do something about it, may be our best friend, our only hope. How many will go with that? Sin, your friend? Maybe so. Uh, so, there we are. So what's the takeaway? Number one, love. It's transformational. Number two, leave judgment to the pros. God, the likes of John Harper. <laughs> Those people, number one, God loves you. Number two, he's God. Um, the judges that we choose in our society, they are experienced, they're trained, and they're disinterested. They're impartial. They're not judging their neighbors, so it's different. Uh, and number three, sin may be your friend if you recognize it and work on doing something to fix it. That's what I got. Thank you. <laughs>